Asian policies and best practices for law enforcement. Senator Ingerbritson, uh, would you like to uh, explain your bill? Uh, I see that you also have an A2 author's amendment. Would you like to uh, move that now and then explain the bill with its inclusion? Yes, yes uh, Mr. Chair, if I could, the uh, A2 amendment is a delete all amendment. All right. Senator Ingerbritson moves the A2 amendment as an author's amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Ingerbritson. Mr. Chair and members, uh, uh, before you is the, uh, uh, something that's been, I think, around for a little while, an eyewitness, uh, <clears throat> eyewitness identification policy bill. And um, what it does, members, uh, and you probably have, Mr. Chair, I, I apologize if we've gone over this before, but the, uh, it's a statewide model policy even directing the, the uh, post board to develop uh, uh, to adopt policies on the eyewitness identification. Basically, uh, I do have two testifiers here that could probably do a better job than I, but uh, it, it does uh, shore up the, uh, the lineup for identification for, for criminal investigations. And, and uh, so I think what I'll do is I, I will do that in the interest of moving things along very quickly, Mr. Mr. Chair, if I could. I'll, uh, I'm not sure which one would like to go first. Okay, Julie Jonas. Thank you, thank you, Senator Ingebrigtsen and all of our Senate sponsors. Will you identify yourself for the record? I will. Mr. Chair and Commit <coughs> committee members, my name's Julie Jonas. I'm the legal director for the Innocence Project of Minnesota. I think it speaks volumes that our chief author is a former sh sheriff. It shows the strong bi bipartisan and community support for this bill. This bill is unopposed by any stakeholders, including the chiefs of police, the sheriff's association, the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension and the Post Board. In fact, Post is already teaching these techniques to new law enforcement trainees. Further, these practices are already in place and used in most metropolitan law enforcement agencies and by the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. Nationwide, they're in use in 26 states. We believe that it should be uniform best practices throughout our state. The Minnesota County Attorneys Association is also here today to show their support. And recently, the Minnesota Supreme Court released a report on eyewitness identification, identification practices, also suggesting that these are the best, the best practices for law enforcement to follow. This legislation is common sense in the area of eyewitness identification and is no cost. The reason my organization supports it is because 70% of all DNA exonerations um, mistaken eyewitness identification was the primary cause, and in 40% of those, it was because of a cross-racial mistaken eyewitness identification. These are hundreds of men that were wrongfully imprisoned for decades for crimes they didn't commit. The thing that makes this so important, I think, for law enforcement is whenever we have the wrong person in prison, the real person is st still out there and still committing crimes. We know in about half of those cases, once the DNA testing was done, the true perpetrator was found. And that person who should have been in prison was actually committing additional crimes. In those cases, we know of at least 64 additional rapes and 17 murders that were committed when the wrong person was in prison um, and the true perpetrator was out. We know this is the case in Minnesota in the David Sutherland case that was in some of the materials provided um, where a Caucasian woman was raped by an African-American male. She made a mistake in eyewitness identification and it wasn't for years after DNA testing that the true perpetrator was found and he had an extensive criminal record. We know that this happened as recently as 2016 in Hennepin County when a woman misidentified her rapist in that case. Luckily, because DNA testing was involved, he was exonerated before trial, but in many, many serious felony cases, DNA testing is not available. So it's crucial that law enforcement uses the best practices when asking witnesses and victims to identify perpetrators. Unfortunately, if the wrong practices are used, a false memory can be created in the victim's mind of who the attacker was. Anecdotally, I've met a couple of women who this has happened to um, in the wrongful conviction area. Two women, Jennifer Thompson and Penny Berenson, both of whom I know, raped um, and made a mistake in eyewitness identification. Later on, in both of those cases, the, the, the suspect who was in prison was exonerated through DNA testing. The true perpetrator was found, 
and both women were able to see that true perpetrator, but still, when they thought back on the night, nights of the attack, they saw the person who was wrongfully convicted. That's what can happen if this is not done correctly. So again, these are common sense, um, easy things for law enforcement to do. There's been a lot of research in this area, and we're lucky enough to have one of the lead researchers in the area who lives in our community. She's a professor at, the university, at Augsburg University, and she's here with us today. She came to just talk a little bit about the science and the research underpinning this, and that's Nancy Stiblay, who's with me today. Ms. Jonas, before we begin, <clears throat> you made reference to hundreds of men that have been wrongly accused and convicted? Yes. Uh, is that a nationwide perspective, or is that, that is in the state of Minnesota? No, that's nationwide. All right. Do you have an idea of how many have been wrongly convicted in Minnesota? Well, we know that the National Registry of Exonerations lists, I want to say 15. It's either, it's right around 15. Of those, only one for certain is a mistaken eyewitness identification. The others are for a variety of different reasons. Right. We'll move on to the next testifier, Ms. Stebley. Did I pronounce that correct? Stubley. Stubley. Would yes. you identify yourself for the record and then proceed? Um, Would you please identify yourself for the record. Okay. My name is Nancy Stubley. I'm and a professor can... of psychology at Augsburg University in, Minnesota, in right. Minneapolis. Please and, proceed, and if you could speak clearly into the microphone. You have a very right. soft voice. So. Is this better? That's All right. perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you. I'll try to do that. Um, I'm here today to uh, speak in support of this bill. And it comes down to two reasons, uh, based on my experience. Uh, the first is the eyewitness science. I have been uh, uh, eyewitness scientist for over 30 years. The science itself on this topic is over 40 years old. So I've been there almost that long. And we now have thousands of experiments. We have uh, both laboratory studies and field studies in support of these recommendations. Um, I think it's important to recognize that um, these four recommendations that flow from the research um, are consensus recommendations. That is, eyewitness scientists have come together and said, this is what we should recommend. These four are sound science, and, and we are in agreement on this. Perhaps more impressive than that, even, is that the National Academy of Sciences, the, the national body of scientists from across the scientific perspectives, um, took on this body of research in about uh, 2014 and vetted it. They looked at it, they came to the conclusion that this is good, sound science, and these recommendations, along with other recommendations that, that they proposed, um, they said, is, this is good, this is good science, and we recommend that these principles should be applied to law enforcement and within um, the legal community. Uh, so there's good, strong science here, and I'm happy to discuss more about that um, if you have questions. The second of the two reasons that I'm here to support it is because it's practicable. I've had the good fortune, great opportunities of working with law enforcement, prosecutors um, across the country in a number of cities, and right here in Hennepin County, um, in Ramsey County, and with the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, in order to um, develop these procedures, to put them into practice, and to see how they work, to make sure that these are sensible in terms of law enforcement practice, in terms of how um, these um, outcomes affect our legal system. And so the combination of good science and, and practice that works uh, makes these um, very powerful recommendations. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. We'll Chairman, if I may, I think notice. that the Minnesota County Attorneys Association might have wanted to say something too. Would you identify yourself for the record? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Robert Small. I'm the Executive Director of the County Attorneys Association. Um, I, uh, Ms. Jonas did uh, indicate that the County Attorneys Association was supportive uh, of this, and uh, I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank Ms. Jonas uh, and others in the uh, Innocence Project for 
uh, working with us and taking into consideration uh, prosecutors' concerns. I also wanted to thank Senator Ingebrigtsen and Senator Latz for uh, their input in taking into consideration the concerns that the county attorneys had. So thank you very much. Thank you. Senator Hall. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Senator, uh, Mr. Chair, I just wonder, is there anybody uh, against this or opposes this? Well, we'll be getting to that. That's what I was just waiting for. In addition to the testifiers before us, is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak for or against this bill? I'm interested in the uh, law enforcement perspective. Is there anyone in the law enforcement community that wishes to speak for or against this bill? They are mentioned in the bill, and it'd be important to hear from them. I do not see anyone here Mr. Uh, coming to the table. Senator Ingerbritson. Might I qualify? Well, you're retired. <laughs> <laughs> and even the, That's despite, right, I am. I'm having a... Despite the fact that you're retired, I guess your opinion means something. So. Well, certainly. And, and, you know, there isn't, there isn't somebody, or any, any officer carrying the badge and carrying out the function of law enforcement and, pr and protecting us out here in Minnesota or, or any state for that matter that I know of that would want to make a false identification on any kind of a criminal case uh, whatsoever. Uh, it, it just absolutely wouldn't um, go against their, their thought process. And, and uh, you know, I know law enforcement's under a lot of scrutiny uh, uh, lately, but uh, in this particular area here, this is very crucial, especially with, with uh, the ability now with DNA and whatnot, and, and uh, we, we see these and we hear these uh, stories of prisoners being released after eight years, eight years of being imprisoned, uh, uh, not because of false identity, but because of uh, the DNA testing. And, and so we have to continue to, to do the best job we can, and, and we being, and if I can speak on the behalf of law enforcement, to make sure that if you're going you're gonna to penalize somebody for a crime, that it is in fact that very person and not somebody else. So, Thank you. Uh, we'll open it up for Further questions or comments by the committee? The committee's kind of quiet today, so uh, uh, Senator, uh, I believe that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Senator Ingbertson, would you wish to move the bill? I do, if, if I might uh, uh, move Senate file 1256 to pass. Uh, Senator Ingerbritson moves Senate File 1256 as amended be recommended to pass and move to the floor. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion prevails. Thank you, Senator Ingerbritson. Thank you, Mr. Fantastic. Chair and members. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move on to Senate File 1950, Senator Chamberlain. Amendment. I do, Mr. Chair, members. I have an A2 author's amendment. Would you like that to be presented at this time? Yes, I would, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Ralph moves the A2 amendment to Senate File 1950. Author's amendment, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Chamberlain? Uh, first, I'd like to, bill? it's an honor to be here and especially to follow my my friend and colleague, uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen, the retired sheriff, so thank you. So um, what we have here is it was uh, brought forward last year. The House has the same bill. This uh, was an issue that, as the chief will explain, came up in the city of Lionel Lakes. It's really not a complicated or a difficult idea. They realized that when they were trying to do a, a check on a business, they could not do that. So what this bill does is just makes it clear for the state of Minnesota and for the federal authorities, again, as the chief will explain, that we can do, that the city municipalities can do background checks on businesses that uh, want to do business in their cities or counties. Um, we chose to not change a few things in here to keep them consistent with current law and discussions with staff and others. Uh, as also for simplicity and uh, since they already have a certain practice and way of doing business, we decided to keep it that way for now and see how it works. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Chief Swanson. 
Chief Swanson, would you identify yourself for the record? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, John Swenson, uh, Public Safety Director and Chief of Police for the City of Lionel Lakes. Um, thank you for uh, considering this legislation. Um, what this is, is uh, in current law, uh, local law enforcement, county uh, sheriffs are authorized to run criminal history checks on individuals that are making application for business license or employment, um, but we're limited to only doing those criminal history checks for the state of Minnesota. Um, and this is, uh, stems from some federal rules in, uh, related to access to the criminal justice information system, which is regulated by the FBI. Um, this creates some challenges for us, and I'll give you an example here shortly uh, of what we are, uh, encountered in Lionel Lakes. Um, but in essence, when we're doing these things, we are giving business license or hiring individuals that may have a criminal conviction in another state which would bar them from that license or employment. Um, and so that's particularly problematic uh, when we're going to our, our local councils with recommendations. Uh, what we experienced in Lionel Lakes um, is, is we had a business application for a massage therapist business. Um, we conducted what we're authorized to do in terms of background checks. Uh, nothing uh, came up that would limit uh, the city's ability to not approve that. The license was granted, and I think it was a grand total of three days before we started receiving complaints from community members um, of allegations of prostitution occurring at this business. Um, after about a two-month investigation, which ended up going uh, into other jurisdictions and involving uh, some federal authorities, um, we were able to shut the business down, and there was charges uh, for prostitution stemming from that and uh, two other locations in other suburban uh, cities in the metro area also resulted as this. Uh, through that investigation, what we determined was is had we had the ability to run a national criminal history check, uh, as this bill would authorize us to do, we would have found other uh, criminal activity that would have barred this individual in our city from getting that business license in the first place. All right. Senator Chamberlain, do you have anyone else uh, to give testimony at this time? No, Mr. Chair. That's it. Uh, I have on my list an Ann, uh, Miss Ann Finn, League of Minnesota Cities. Welcome to the committee. Would you identify yourself for the record? Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Ann Finn. I represent the League of Minnesota Cities, and I'm here to thank uh, Senator Chamberlain for bringing this bill forward. Uh, thank you. That's good. Um, it'll be good. Yeah, it will. Uh, I also wanted to just let you know that um, Chief Swenson brought this bill to our policy committees this uh, past interim, and when he described the issue, um, there was a collective nod in the room by city officials from all over the state. So we strongly support this legislation and uh, would ask for your support as well. Thank you. Right. Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to speak for or against this bill? <clears throat> Hearing none, we'll open it up for committee discussion. Senator Ralph. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, uh, I'm wondering how you came up with the list of businesses that you're, that you would be investigating. And I, I, I'd have thought maybe it might have been a little more expansive, but I just wondered why you came up with this particular list. Thank you. Uh, Chief. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator. Um, we worked with the BCA to look at this, and one of the criteria for the FBI for access to this is that it's limited in scope. And so we really looked at um, what uh, local municipalities in, in Minnesota are, are licensing and, and tried to craft a bill that was limited in scope but yet still uh, gave uh, municipalities the opportunity to do this. It doesn't, nowhere in this bill is it mandatory that they do that. Uh, but it is permissive in, in nature. And so um, in working with the BCA, uh, we developed this list and actually um, through some 
conversations last year at committee hearings in the House, um, there was the amendment that was just uh, presented today. Any other questions? Senator Lab or Dietzig. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I, following up on Senator Ralph's questions on just how you came up with the list, so I just have a few more, just wondering if you thought about them. Um, and then some of these, I don't know if Ms. Finn wants to come back or if you all could answer. So on the applicant for employment, um, an individual who seeks either county or city employment where the job duties include access to residential property or business property. Um, so do they already do background checks on like firefighters, law enforcement, um, city inspectors, city water works? Um, and then what's not on here, so your, your cable company employees have access to, to property, so I don't know if, if they need to be in there. Um, telephone company, if people have landlines still, they have access to residential or business property. And then when you go down to the applicant for licensure, um, in my city there's Airbnbs, so if you're trying to do trafficking, I don't know if they license those, and so I don't know if that is another place where this would need to be listed if you're going to look at Airbnbs. And then you have taxi service, but you don't have Lyft and Uber, and so transportation network companies. And so I know that in, when we did the bill a few years ago, we, we just did the, the insurance portion, and then Minneapolis and St. Paul have their own ordinances, and some other communities might have their own ordinances where they do background checks. But in this gig economy, you have, I don't know if others do, if we need to, they get contracts with the city, so I don't know if we need to check any other, the transportation network drivers or limousine drivers. I don't know in the scope of your bill if you've considered including or looking at any of those other entities and, and why just these entities. And then on page 2.9, on 2 uh, the city and county shall submit the applicant signed informed consent, fingerprints, and fees. So who pays those fees? Is it the applicant or is it the city or county? Chief Swenson. Yeah. Mr. Chair, Senator, um, first related to the applicant for employment. So I can speak specifically to police uh, and fire. Um, those backgrounds are, are more expansive than what uh, is authorized for other positions. Um, and I can speak for the city of Lionel Lakes, we do background checks on all employees. We just aren't authorized to do the national background checks for individuals that aren't police officers and firefighters. And so this would give us an opportunity that, for example, uh, an employee for working um, in our water department that may have access to a residential home or a business home, we would do that national background check. Um, the, in terms of the, the list here, um, there was a lot of conversation around that and certainly would be happy to entertain uh, um, any other conversations related to adding or uh, to this list. I will say that um, we were very deliberate about the process here because uh, the FBI, which again holds the authority to grant access to this database, has reviewed this legislation in its current form and given a, uh, for lack of a better term, a pre-authorization that they would grant access to it. And so any changes that are made to this bill would create a question mark related to whether the FBI will continue to honor, honor the access to this. Um, the informed consent uh, portion of this is just consistent with making sure that when we have people coming in uh, to do pursuing an employment <coughs> or a business license that they know exactly what is going to take place. And so, um, and in terms of the cost, the employers, uh, I know in our city, we incur that cost uh, if, we're, if we're going to be uh, employing someone. Uh, business licenses, that is a cost that we would pass on to the applicant. And that would be listed on our fees, which is uh, approved by our city council on an annual basis. Any other discussion? Senator Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Chamberlain, 
on 1.14, <coughs> what is a cabaret? <laughs> I haven't been to one. I don't know. Mark Chamberlain. So, <laughs> it sounds like an entertainment. It, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator, uh, Senator Hall, I'm not sure. It sounds like an entertainment facility uh, place, but I have not been to one. Anyone up there uh, care to offer any insight? I think election year is coming up. No one's going to admit it. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair, I, I wonder, I, I'm Senator somewhat Hall. serious about this in the sense I wonder if uh, council can tell us uh, is there a definition for that? Is that the same thing as a gentleman's club or a strip joint? Uh, just trying to figure out exactly what they're talking about. I'd be happy to know. Thank you, Senator Hall. Uh, which one of our council would like to wrestle with this one? You have a lot of council. Mr. Chair and members, I'm just searching our statutes to see if there's a definition, <laughs> but I don't see one um, <laughs> included in statute. So Mr. Chair, I, Senator Hall. I just wonder if uh, it's a loophole for someone to say, well, we're not a cabaret, we're you know, a strip joint, we're not a gentleman's club. I, I just don't know the difference. Maybe Senator Latz would know. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Latz, do you care to answer this question? What would make you think I would <laughs> answer that question? Well, because you're a lawyer. That uh, you you uh, understand well, a lot of those. So let Senate, me do a Google Senate search Dietrich here. Knows. We'll find out. Order, order. Uh, Mr. Chair, maybe uh, Chief Swanson could, Swenson could uh, offer some sure. insight because uh, they worked on it. Chief Swenson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator, um, yes, cabaret and our discussions are related to just exactly what you alluded to, a gentleman's club, uh, strip club, adult entertainment uh, facilities. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Latz. According to the dictionary online, <laughs> cabaret is an entertainment held in a nightclub or restaurant while the audience eats or drinks at tables. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, this definition needs a lot more work. <laughs> Or you're going to be capturing just about every place that has any kind of entertainment and sells food or drink. Chan has some dinner so, theater. There we go. Mr. Chair. Senator Hall. Uh, I seriously wonder if we should uh, come up with an amendment that kind of covers this a little bit more of uh, what the uh, chief here was talking about. Uh, I've been given a suggestion that we would leave it up to the local government to define it. Is that... Would, would that create more of a problem? Does council have a, a thought on it, Senator? <laughs> Mr. Council? Mr. Chair and members, um, the, since cabarets are licensed by local governments, I'm assuming that they have local ordinances which also define uh, what a cabaret is and who needs um, a license in order to operate. So council, does that mean that current definition of a cabaret is left to the local governing authority? Uh, Mr. Chair, members, yes, that's what I would assume. <laughs> Mr. Chair? Senator Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think uh, Senator Chamberlain and I can talk about this some more offline and uh, see if an amendment is needed on the floor. Senator Mr. Chamberlain, Chairs, would you agree to that? Mr. Chair, Senator Hall, members, uh, yeah, this is going to go to, I think it's your committee next. Yeah, yeah, I think it's going to go to local gov next after this. So um, we can chat about it and tidy that up. I know Senator Latz likes to this, get this stuff done. I'll guarantee we'll get it done, Senator Latz. Well, Mr. Ch <laughs> Senator Chamberlain, um, other committees might act like that. <laughs> The Judiciary Committee likes to define the terms before we send it out for anyone's recommendation. Senator Latz, did you want to add to this conversation? Well, Mr. Chairman, I, cabaret is an awfully broad term. I, it's so broad, I would guess Senator Chamberlain has been to a cabaret, just didn't know it was described as such. Um, I'm inclined to delete that provision right now unless we put something more in. And if there's a desire to clarify it and add it later, uh, unless we want to work on it now, um, maybe lay it over and, and come up with a definition that provides a little more clarity as to what it is 
that we intend to qualify for a background check unless you know the consensus is that uh, you know any, any restaurant that you know has entertainment at any time of any sort uh, you know should be subject to this kind of a background check as well as part of the licensing process I, I just have one final comment thank you Senator Latz mr. chair Senator Chamberlain um, thank you uh, two pieces, I guess. One is, alludes, uh, goes back to Chief Swenson's point, is that uh, they had discussions with the BCA and the FBI to make sure the language was right and wasn't too expansive, that it was something that they could get access to the national database for, with. Um, secondly, to counsel and to your comment about local, the local decision, it is fairly broad according to the one online dictionary, dictionary there might be other definitions, uh, Oxford or something else. Um, but local authorities already have pretty broad authority to grant or not grant licenses. They could decide on a whim not to grant a license. I think we've all experienced this, not grant a license to a perfectly legal restaurant or have something halfway through and then decide to take it back. So I, I think the definition is workable for the reason that Chief Swenson stated, and also because the local authorities already have broad discretion in who they will and will not grant licenses to. Um, thirdly, we can certainly chat about it uh, after this, before it goes to local gov. I'd hate to just, you know, go in and, I think it requires a little bit more discussion and thought before we just change the definition on the fly. Uh, Senator Chamberlain, did you have anyone from the BCA help in drafting the bill? Uh, Chief Swenson? Uh, Mr. Chair, yes. Uh, we worked with Superintendent Drew Evans and his staff. Um, and actually, because it had to be in a very uh, specific format for submission to the FBI, they drew that up and brought it back to us for review. Thank you. Ms. Angler, you must have heard us talk about the BCA, so uh, <laughs> welcome, welcome to, to the table. <laughs> Mr. Chair, members, Katie Angler from the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. I apologize for my voice today. Um, yes, we did work with Chief Swenson. Um, the list is one that the, the chief provided to us. Um, it, I think in terms of what the FBI will do with this with respect to their authority from the U.S. Attorney General, as long as the description is specific and they can identify who is subject to the federal check, that's what they're looking for. So if you choose to uh, provide some additional information around who that uh, party is in line 1.14, you certainly are entitled to do that. Um, the, the language will have, to, if enacted and signed, will have to be resubmitted and will have to go through the actual approval process. And as I said, so long as it's specific, um, it is unlikely to pose a problem exactly how something is defined. Uh, Ms. Angler, did the FBI have any definition of what a cabaret is? Uh, Mr. Chair, no. And did, uh, did the BCA have a definition of what cabaret is? Mr. Chair, no, we don't. We, we leave that to the, the organizations that are coming forward with a request for this type of check um, to identify who they believe should be subject to the check. All right. Senator Latz. Uh, Mr. Chairman, so it sounds to me like the part that the FBI needs is on the second page, paragraph B. Um, that's, that's if I understood what a counsel explained to me offline here. That's the magic language they need to be able to allow the background check. It sounds like the rest of the stuff in here is, is the, uh, um, the parameters that we're setting, or we propose to set um, around when the governments could do the background checks, but it doesn't sound like that's part of the FBI requirements. Am I wrong on that? Okay, so it sounds like we have to limit the scope as well. We can't just, of the purpose of the background? Maybe you can say that on the record if you would, Council. Yeah. Ms. Council, Ms. Primo. Mr. Chair and members, I'm actually not sure about the purpose, but I do know that as I believe the BCA and maybe the Chief testified, the scope does have to be limited in terms of 
who is subject to the background check. Um, but maybe uh, the BCA could speak a little bit more about whether the purpose has to be limited as well. Ms. Angler, did you hear that? Uh, Mr. Chair, I think I heard most of it. Um, Mr. Chair and members, uh, what uh, the federal law that governs access to the federal repositories requires is that the authority to do the check be specific enough so that when transactions are audited, um, the auditor, whether it be from the Federal Bureau of Investigation or from the BCA, can determine that, in fact, the person whose criminal history was retrieved is a person who is subject to the background check. So there has to be some specificity in the state statute that you enact that says who is subject to the check. Senator Dietzik. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So as I was Googling under Minnesota statutes, it appears Minnesota statute 617-242 is adult entertainment establishments. And the definition adult entertainment establishment means a business that is open only to adults and that pre presents live performances that are distinguished or characterized by an emphasis on the depiction of sexual conduct or nudity. That's the sexual conduct and nudity are defined. And then it also further down says restrictions on ownership or management by persons convicted of certain crimes so that a person um, with certain offenses, including prostitution, trafficking, crim sex conduct, solicitation of children, and it goes on, cannot operate an adult business establishment. So that might be one. It was 617 what? Point two four two. Adult entertainment establishments. Mr. Dietzik, uh, are you suggesting we use that in place of the word cabaret? Um, I am offering that up for the um, author to consider. Senator Chamberlain or Chief Swenson is. Um, just my what's your quick opinion? thought, uh, Mr. Chair, members. Um, if if uh, what Ms. Engler has mentioned, specificity, um, I would think that gives it more, that becomes more specific as to what the purpose, and I think that's what Chief Swenson and Lionel Lakes and the municipalities are looking for is that sort of establishment. We had a few laughs earlier, but I think that that is essentially what we're looking at is, they're looking at is that sort of entertainment and I would be that's comfortable because it's more specific it's not overly broad and perhaps it's where we want to be anyway so uh, uh, chief chief Swenson mr. chair members of the committee yes I, I believe that would operate an adult entertainment as defined as I'm reading it here I think that fits the bill certainly for what uh, we would like to address in the city of Lionel Lakes further discussion I'll, Senator Dietzik. Um, I'll offer that an amendment. Uh, Senator Dietzik. Thank you. Um, I think have the <laughs> perhaps council can help in uh, forming uh, an oral amendment. Sort of reference to that statute. Mr. Chair and members, um, just to make sure I understand Senator Dietzik's amendment, it would be at line 1.14. Delete cabaret, insert adult entertainment establish establishment as defined in 617.242 subdivision one, paragraph one. Is that correct? <laughs> and Mr. Chair, I can repeat that if it's helpful. Why don't we do it one more time? Could you repeat it one more time? Line 1.14, delete a cabaret, insert as an adult entertainment establishment as defined in 617.242, subdivision one, paragraph one. Oh, clause one, clause one. Clause one. Is everyone under, does everyone understand the oral amendment? Is there further discussion on the oral amendment? Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Johnson. Could counsel just last time the site on that? Could you repeat the site one more time? Um, Ms. Primo. Mr. Chair, members, I'll actually repeat the amendment. There's a 
grammatical error there. Um, line, page one, line 14, delete a cabaret, insert operate an adult entertainment establishment as defined in section 617.242, subdivision one, clause one. Everyone get that? Everyone's <laughs> nodding. Uh, further discussion? Hearing none, uh, Senator Dietzik moves the amendment as described by council. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The amendment is adopted. Is there further discussion regarding Senate File 1950? Senator Latz. Mr. Chairman, I assume that an applicant for a liquor license is already somewhere uh, allowed for this kind of background check, so we don't need to have anything like that in here. Chief Swenson, do you know? Mr. Chair, Senator Latz, yes, that is addressed in the licensing of uh, liquor establishments already, and those, those uh, criminal history queries are authorized currently. And right. Mr. Senator Chairman, um, on the uh, line 19 on page 1, it makes a reference to permit for a premise permit for lawful gambling. Um, <coughs> isn't the gambling manager who is required by law already subject to a background check? So this is broadening that a bit? Uh, I am not aware. Uh, anyone at the testifying table know that answer or counsel? Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Angler. The answer is yes. They are already subject. So, Mr. Chairman, one question would be whether or not we need to expand it to the operator of the, the premise permit or the, the holder of the premise <coughs> permit as opposed to the gambling manager who is the, the individual, I believe, that would be held accountable for the operation of the gambling itself, unless I'm missing something. It's been a while since I've looked at that statute. Uh, Senator Latz, uh, just for the sake of discussion, um, would this apply to uh, Native American gambling uh, as well as gambling operations that might be uh, non-Native American? And would that mean a, a pull tab operator in a bar? Would that now fit that operations title in your definition? Well, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm not sure I can answer the question about application to Native American gaming. Um, the way I'm looking at line 19, it, it seems to me that lawful gambling is a term in statute that refers to charitable gambling such as the pull tab operator, the local hockey association, they've got a gambling manager, uh, they, get they get agreement from bunnies in St. Louis Park to, to run the pull tabs there and get the proceeds from it. Um, but this would apply, I presume, then whoever the premise permit holder is for bunnies, if it's bunnies itself or if it's, uh, or if it's the hockey association. Uh, so I guess I'm questioning whether or not this broadens it unnecessarily whether the protections are already in place because I think the gambling manager would be subject to this kind of a background check or mm -hmm. I guess I'm kind of asking because I don't know the answers here and want to make sure we target what we need to target yeah. and not more. Senator Latz, uh, I've been told that uh, when it comes to gambling references, that is not the jurisdiction of this committee. It would be that of state government committee. Mm, good. Um, so if we did add it, uh, this commit this bill might have to go to the state government committee. Well, Mr. Chairman, it's already in the bill. The gambling references are part oh. of the new bill. <coughs> I see. So it might have to go there anyway. Okay. Well, I suppose that's up to the the decision of the chairman of that committee. It is going to the local uh, government committee if it passes this committee. So, um, well, Senator so, Latz, did I you want to make this in the form of an amendment, or do you want to just, should we kick it around a little bit? Well, I, I'm not sure that we can obtain, I'm not sure we're going to be able to get the answer to my question here today. Um, and so, I mean, if it's going to, I would think it would need to go to state government at some point. 
because it subjects their jurisdictional premises to uh, to these background checks. Uh, sorry to have you know, Senator Chamberlain would rather not run the gamut, but it's there's a long list here. The more committees, the better. That's what I say. <laughs> That's what I like. And I guess there's one other question that I had too, which was uh, whether or not um, anyone from the Second Chance Coalition or other stakeholders, how broadly this was vetted, <laughs> um, to see if there's any broader unintended consequences uh, relating to this uh, bill, just to get a sense of uh, whether we're making it unnecessarily difficult in certain circumstances to get. Uh, licenses, how much of this is within the discretion of local government, how much of this is looking for uh, uh, licenses that are already prohibited under current law, under state statute, we're just trying to get the data. I mean, to me, that's a little bit different than um, something that's just completely within the discretion of local government. I take a little bit of issue with the suggestion that local government has unfettered authority to deny licenses. Uh, they don't if, if an applicant meets the criteria within a local ordinance. Um, I don't think they can deny an app a license or they'd be, uh, they'd be facing a lawsuit. Um, so I'm d I guess I'm trying to get a sense of where's the d how does the discretion get exercised here and is it overly broad for the purposes which I agree with, which are to make sure people who shouldn't be operating certain establishments aren't able to. I see Senator Latsett on line 2.3. This is with the use of the word may. Uh, this gives cities permissive authority. It's not a mandatory authority. I don't know if that changes your logic or not, but nevertheless, uh, it could result in uh, a denial uh, uh, if someone found uh, information regarding an individual that may be considered a threat to the community or a threat to a particular business and its influence on the community. Mr. Chairman, I, I suspect that that may will turn into a shall as a practical matter because any local government that then fails to run a national background check on an applicant for something like this and misses information that would cause them concern. Mr. Chair. Um, resulting in harm down the road, uh, there'd be some liability exposure there. I, I suspect uh, League of Minnesota Cities Insurance Trust would advise their local cities mm -hmm. to uh, go ahead and mm -hmm. run these checks. Okay. Senator Chamberlain. Well, well, I mean, Senator Latz, we're happy to, if you get an amendment, let's have it, all right? Uh, so the cities are stuck between a rock and a hard place. They either do a background check and make sure these uh, establishments are safe and nobody gets hurt, or they don't and they, they're liable on the other side. Uh, no matter what we do here, where something will probably be missed. We work hard to make sure that all these, none of the big stuff gets missed, but sometimes we miss something. But at some point, there's discretion. Always is. Even if we, uh, we could sit here for, as you know, for days and not come to some perfect conclusion about how this should be written. But uh, there's always going to be some discretion. And, and the cities have, cities and towns and counties have wide discretion, because I've known a lot of things get pulled and uh, put in at the last minute to what they have to do or can't do, and then even not even finish construction. So, yes, there is discretion. Um, it's, and if they feel they've been wrong, then I think there's recourse and appeals, due process, and litigation as well. Can everybody do that? No. But... Um, if you have an amendment, I say, Senator Latz, let's see it, and we'll discuss it. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's going to go to a local gov, and then if they want, they can call into in the state gov, too. But you could say that about anything. That's what they're trying to do here, be very specific as to not make it overly broad. Um, I've had a conversation with BCA and others, so if you have an amendment, we'll, we'll entertain it. Otherwise, we'll move and we'll talk about it some more. But... Discretion is always going to be there, and uh, you know, abuse can happen everywhere. But uh, we try to limit it as much as we can. The cities, municipalities, in a rock and a hard place. They're just trying to do the best they can here. I have no doubt about their sincerity and what they're trying to accomplish. That's all I have. Thank you. Senator Latz. So, Mr. Chairman, it, it sounds like the answer to my question is that this is not just 
for the purpose of seeking information that would uh, determine if a person is under existing statute prohibited from any of these uh, operating any of these uh, uh, businesses, um, but also to inform the discretionary decision for someone who's not necessarily prohibited by statute uh, as the city determines whether or not to issue um, a license. No, Senator Latz, you've misinterpreted that quite a bit. This, uh, you are an attorney, uh, Senator Limiter, Senator Latz, you're an attorney. That's ex not ex what I said. Well, to be clear and for the record, Senator Latz, what I said is there's always going to be discretion no matter what we do. I didn't say we're creating this so that the cities and counties have the discretion to do whatever they want. So you twisted my words. We had a pleasant conversation here about a, a reasonable uh, 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 bill, and what you've just done is it turned into some accusatory process that the cities and counties will use to uh, manipulate the system. And that is not what I said for the record. Not what I said, not what I implied. So for the record, let that be clear. It's not what I said. I'll defer the rest to Senator Limmer. Senator Latz. Mr. Chairman. Any further comment? Well, I don't want to get accused of stuff again either. I was trying to get clarity on Senator Chamberlain's previous answer. And apparently, I was not clear on it. So I guess I'm still trying to get some clarity. There are two ways as I see this. <coughs> this is, it sounds to me like, which is the way I put it, Mr. Chairman, it sounds to me like we're looking at more than just getting information <coughs> for statutory prohibitions on licensure, but also seeking to give the city's information that they can use an exercise of non-statutory prohibitions or more discretionary decisions. I'm not saying pro or, and if I'm wrong about that, Senator Chamberlain, I'd like the facts to be clarified, but I'm not trying to twist anyone's words here. If I can't get a straight answer to my questions, I'm gonna vote no on the bill because I'm not fully informed on it. Um, but I think I'm entitled to ask legitimate questions. This is the first time this bill has come before me the first time I get a chance to look at this and analyze that, and if Senator Chamberlain doesn't like appearing before the Judiciary Committee because we ask tough questions about well, the, the stuff that there, comes before There we us, go again. Uh, Senator the table, Latz Mr. has the Chairman. floor. Uh, there we go again, accusatory. Really sad. But uh, Chief Swenson has something to say. Chief Swenson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Latz. Um, I could speak to kind of process uh, for Lionel Lakes um, and how that goes. So a reason for denial, we have to provide reasons for denial. There are grounds for appeal. There, are, there is recourse for applicants uh, for this. This is legislation that would position local governments and counties to get the information to make informed decisions about applicants. Um, and in terms of those processes, we need to make sure as a local government that those are rooted in sound practices in the law, otherwise we're, we're subject to, to lawsuits and, and adverse impacts for our communities. And certainly that's not uh, anything that any local uh, municipality is going to <coughs> be terribly excited about uh, incurring. Mr. Chairman, uh, Chief Swenson, thank you for that answer. That does help me understand what the scope of the impact of this bill would be. Um, I guess I still have one answered, unanswered question out there, which is um, other than the BCA and the law enforcement group and the League of Minnesota Cities, uh, was this proposal circulated or made known to other organizations that have interest in background checks? Um, including those who participate in the Second Chance Coalition to determine if they thought that there would be any issues relating to the proposal before us. It's a simple yes or no question, I'm not making any accusations, I'm trying to find out who knew about this and was in a position to come before this committee to offer an opinion if they chose to do so. Chief Swenson. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Latz, uh, I, I did not present this legislation to any other governments other than those noted uh, earlier. Um, I can say that it has been uh, at the House, um, two different uh, committees. Um, there were individuals that spoke uh, about um, 
issues that they had with them. Specifically, one of the amendments, the, the first amendment you saw tonight was was based on comments received at, I believe, local government at the House last year. Um, but to answer your question, I have not uh, solicited any information from the Second Chance Coalition. One thing I'm noticing is, is that this bill was created on March 4th of last year. So it's been in the public domain and any organization would, if they so desired, could make a comment about it or speak to the author or for that matter, come to the committee members we have today and give us their opinion. I haven't heard of anyone coming to me as a chairman of the committee to come and talk uh, outside of the testifiers that I have seen before us. Is there any further discussion? Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, uh, Senator Chamberlain, for bringing this forward. I think uh, this is a very narrowly tailored bill, uh, just opening it up to several businesses where we might find uh, some questionable activity in it. And I appreciate you bringing this forward to protect our citizens in those communities uh, from these individuals who feel like they can be moving from state to state uh, in an effort to dodge law enforcement. So uh, I think this is a great, uh, great bill moving forward. We've tightened it up a little bit more thanks to uh, Senator Hall. And um, I think I'm comfortable with the language the way it's written and, and appreciate uh, this piece. Further discussion? Hearing none. Senator Johnson moves Senate file 1950 as amended be recommended to pass and move to the state government local government committee All those in favor say aye, aye. Opposed uh, the motion prevails. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Chair members Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, We will move to Senate file 1621 Senator Rarick Sorry, Senator Rarick, Senate File 1621, uh, regarding fireworks. I understand you have an author's amendment as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, we do have a, an amendment, and I think we also have an amendment to that amendment, but we'll take uh, All right. the first uh, one. Is that the A3 amendment that you're looking at? The A3 is the first one we would like well, let's, to move. Yes, let's please. take them one by one. Um, Senator Hall moves the author's amendment, the A3 amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? The amendment is adopted. Now, Senator Rarick, do you have another, is it a written amendment? Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe um, I was working with Mr. Backus. Um, we caught a, a little error um, just before committee started. I'm not sure if it's written or if it's uh, it, it is, is written. Uh, okay. We're uh, passing it out now, so let's just pause for a moment until every member has a copy of it. Does everyone have the uh, A5 amendment before them? Members are saying they do not have it yet. Uh, despite the fact that the A5 amendment is an author's amendment, uh, I'm 
I'm going to let council explain the A5 amendment. Uh, it was something that was not in our packets before this very moment. So, council. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Backus. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Yes, the A5 amendment would have been incorporated into the delete everything except for the timing of the discovery. Uh, essentially, the original bill and the A3 amendment that you just adopted, uh, I think inadvertently treated novelty items different than what the author intended. Uh, under current law and in the bill, uh, persons under 18 can't uh, purchase uh, legal fireworks. They, uh, they can't be used on public property, things like that. The bill inadvertently left novelty items out of that. So what this does is it includes novelty items so that persons under 18 can't purchase them, you can't use them in public, and a purchaser has to require proof of age by uh, photographic identification. The new uh, provision uh, is line 1.8 to 1.10. That's actually in the amendment as well, but that only applies to aerial and audible devices, and that's the limitation on when they can be used. All right. And this is an author's amendment. Um, Senator Ralph moves the A5 author's amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bill. Yeah, thank amended. you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, thank you for hearing uh, this bill. Um, I will keep my testimony uh, to start with uh, very brief. Um, I'm not 100% sure uh, exactly what form the members have heard this bill in in the past. Uh, for the last four and a half years, I've worked on this in the House, and I know Senator Westrom worked on it here in the Senate, um, but I, so I'm unsure what uh, form uh, he had last presented it in. Um, but I'll give you some of the highlights, and then I'll hand off to testifiers. Um, the, one of the things that this bill will do, um, a couple of years ago, we dedicated 25% of the sales taxes from fireworks to volunteer fire assistance grants and another 25% to the fire safety account. This will extend that, that if we um, expand the use, that that sales tax will in, go to those expanded uses as, and cover those as well. Um, this changes uh, definitions. So we are defining the aerial and audible fireworks. Um, one of the questions that we had heard many times from uh, people is we're using an industry standard for that definition. And they were worried that if uh, industry changed that definition, Minnesota law would change. So we've tied it to the, a specific date. So that definition from 2001 is what we're referencing. So the industry cannot change what we're considering as aerial and audible. Um, again, the, the amendment helped. Um, it ensured that we were restricting the possession and use to those who are 18 and older. Um, we're also extending uh, the coverage. Um, current law states that the local municipalities uh, are limited on the fees that they can charge for permitting, and this is just going to make sure that that continues on to the expanded use. Um, we made very clear, one of the things that I've heard uh, throughout the whole time that I've talked about the bill and uh, had conversations with folks is, I understand that there are areas, especially in rural Minnesota, where fireworks uh, are fit in very well and people wish to have them. And then there are areas in urban and uh, suburban areas that uh, they're not desired. So we made it very clear in the bill that a local jurisdiction has the ability to pass an ordinance to restrict the use uh, that they would not be allowed there if they felt it didn't fit in. So um, this bill would allow any place in Minnesota to have them. So Places that feel it is proper and would work in their area can, and places that feel it's not proper would have the ability to restrict that use. And then the last uh, provision, um, there was, I've had a lot of discussion as to whether we should require sales to be in permanent structures or if we should have allow the tents or the temporary structures. Um, the one thing that I've come to believe is that we have many uh, Fundraising events that, that use in groups, whether it be church groups, Boy Scouts, uh, whatever the organization, uses fireworks sales as a fundraising event in Minnesota. And if we restrict the use of temporary tents, we would eliminate them from this market and they would not be able to do their fundraiser. So uh, we put a provision in the bill that if you sell for 45 days or fewer, 
you would be allowed to sell out of a temporary structure. If you were going to sell for longer than that, be a, a year-round sales or longer than the 45 days, you would then have to sell out of a permanent structure that meets the NFPA standards. And with that, I will turn over to testifiers and be willing to stand for more specific questions. Uh, I see a number of testifiers here. Who would like to be first? Uh, Mr. Haynes, would you be first? Yeah, I'll go first. Thank you. Right. Will you Chairman. identify yourself for the record yep. first? My name is Steve Haynes. I'm the owner, partner of Bear Creek Pyrotechnics. Uh, Mr. Chair, committee members, I appreciate the ability to come and testify in front of you today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Bear Creek Pyrotechnics is a fireworks display company. We serve Minnesota and western Wisconsin. And we would be one of those companies that would have some retail locations if this bill is passed into law. Uh, I appreciate the ability to support this legislation because I believe that small business should be encouraged in this state and supported. Uh, in an era when revenue is in short supply, any revenue stream should be considered. Uh, these tents or permanent structures would create jobs. Uh, in rural Minnesota, the ability for somebody to have a part-time job for a month and a half, you know, that little bump in their income is helpful. Uh, the creation of jobs is a good thing. Revenue leaving our state needlessly is not. Uh, over the years, uh, opponents of fireworks have, have uh, insisted that accidents, injuries, fires, they'll increase. Since the current law is so difficult to enforce, it's hard to see that that would change very much by legalizing aerial law. I work in North Minneapolis, and, and I work in a uh, facility that has tanks that go 48 feet in the air. Anytime around the 4th of July, I can look around the neighborhood and I can see fireworks in any direction as far as you can see. Basically, if you, have, if you want them, you have them. Uh, it seems a shame that Minnesota is not willing to claim the revenue from that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haynes. Um, Mr. Almer, would yes, you identify yourself for the record? Chris Almer, TNT Fireworks. Um, so basically, I'm going to talk about the uh, Senator Eric said all the tents that you see around. Um, TNT last year had 101 firework tents across the state of Minnesota, um, big cities, small cities, and a lot of those tents are ran by nonprofit groups. Since 2007, we've partnered with... Pardon me, Mr. Ulmer. Yeah. There's conversations on either side of the table, and I wish they could carry them out to the side room. Thank you. Mr. Ulmer? No problem. Please proceed. <laughs> Mr. Chair, since 2007, uh, TNT has partnered with over 570 nonprofit groups across the state, uh, generating income to those groups of over $2.5 million. Um, since 2002, the best estimate, I've only had my hand in Minnesota fireworks since 2007, so that's firm data. But our estimate is over $3 million has been raised by nonprofit groups since fireworks have been legal. Um, safety, everyone talks about safety in fireworks tents. We require all of our nonprofit groups, whether it's, like they said, church group, band boosters, Boy Scouts, they attend a training session. We train them on handling fireworks, packaging fireworks, storing fireworks, transporting fireworks, um, proper NFPA standards for merchandising fireworks. Um, they're trained on checking identification. Um, even if it's a little box of sparklers or poppets, gotta be 18 to buy it. We train them on all the safety standards. Um, it's a great way for our groups to raise funds, uh, to get their name in the community, community outreach, and eliminating sales from temporary structures would hurt those groups tremendously. Thank you. Um, also, we have Chief uh, Wayne Kuwich. Chief, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Welcome to the committee. Would you identify yourself? Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Wayne Kiewicz. Uh Thank you for taking my testimony today as you deliberate whether or not to expand the use of fireworks in Minnesota. I am the Chief of the Richfield Fire Department and I am here today on behalf of the Minnesota Fire Association Coalition. This is an organization comprised of four statewide associations. The Minnesota State Fire Chiefs, the Minnesota Fire Department Association, the Fire Marshals Association of Minnesota, 
and the Minnesota chapter of the Inter International Association of Arson Investigators. As passionate inv advocates of public safety, we continue to oppose any and all expansion of fireworks as they indisputably cause injuries and fires. This proposed legislation would legalize the recreational use of explosives. We believe the use of explosives should be left to professionals. This bill references standards from the American Pyrotechnics Association, which only allows voting membership to commercial users of fireworks, distributors of fireworks, and manufacturing of the fireworks. You would think a standard that is looking at the safety of the public and industry would include all of the stakeholders and not just industry insiders that have a vested interest that may not be balanced with the public interest. National Fire Protection Association standards are consensus standards that bring all stakeholders to the table. On the NFPA 1124 committee, which is referenced in the bill, the APA has a seat, multiple fireworks companies, the fire service, and other stakeholders. There is a very balanced representation of the NFPA 1124 committee. It is not dominated by the fire service. The NFPA 1124 version in the bill cites the 2006 version, which is outdated. The current version is the 2017 version. And that standard, I'd like to point out, no longer covers uh, firework sales in structures. The technical committee, composed of stakeholders from industry and the fire service, were unable to come to a consensus on how to safely protect a, a brick and mortar structure when it sells fireworks and contains fireworks. Are you finished with your testimony? One more, Chief? please. Right. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Arguments are made that people already use these types of explosives and it, it just be made legal. We just heard that. While that argument may be appealing, I would caution that legalization would dramatically increase their use and thus increase the number of injuries and fires. We all know there's people that don't do it just because it's illegal. Um, you legalize it, we're going to see an increase in people trying it out, and the, the higher volume users of uh, the more people using fireworks, we're going to end up with more injuries and more fires. In my 24 years as a firefighter, I've been at, I'd say, three quarters, if not 80% uh, of the 4th of July's I've been at a structure fire or dealing with someone with second degree burns. We would ask you to consider leaving fireworks to the professionals that have the appropriate training and precautions in place to keep observers safe. Thank you for the opportunity to share our concerns with you. Thank you, Chief. Also on our testifier list is Ms. Judy Cook. Welcome to the committee, Ms. Cook. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Judy Cook with Cook Gerard Associates, and I represent Phantom Fireworks Company, also known as B.J. Allen Ms. Company. Ms. Cook, could you speak Oh, am I not? Sorry. Uh, do you want me to start over? No. no. Just keep on going. One of the nation's leading retailers of consumer fireworks. We appreciate the opportunity to discuss this issue with Senator Rarick over the years and uh, do appreciate his reference to permanent structures in this bill, but continue to have concerns with Senate File 1621. Um, Phantom Fireworks does support the expansion of the allowable fireworks permitted to be sold and used in Minnesota, but we believe um, allowing t sales in tents for 45 days each year will result in a market that will be dominated by independent contractors selling fireworks for 10 to 14 days, approximately on behalf of a fireworks distributor, not full-time fireworks employees who know and understand this expanded product. Um, Phantom Fireworks operates 82 fireworks showrooms around the country, including four next door in Wisconsin. They all have permanent buildings with trained employees. Most are open year-round. They have many safety precautions, including specific owl whisk, fire suppression, um, and all appropriate safety measures. Phantom pays uh, property, payroll, income, and sales taxes and are good partners with their local communities. Licensing fees paid to the state range from $1,500 to $5,000 per license in those states. Um, and um, given the way this bill is crafted, no fireworks companies will make a business investment in Minnesota for a permanent structure when there are dozens of tents uh, that don't have a similar investment that will be all around them taking advantage of the marketing dollars they've spent. Uh, we are concerned that this bill doesn't provide the safety and enforcement policies uh, that you might see in the non-permanent structures. 
uh, concerned about uh, sales tax remittance. Um, the local governments have a hundred uh, capped licensing fee of $100, which we don't think will um, cover the costs associated with enforcing the law. Um, let's see. Um, the other concern we've seen in other states is these tents is that um, because you have so many tents, you do have um, operators who are not the good ones, like some of them are and most of them are, but do um, sell what's called overloaded fireworks that are well above the legal limits for consumer fireworks. Also, most of the tents are, are um, in like parking lots where you have a lot of activity, which also can create safety issues. Uh, we just suggest that it's more appropriate to have permanent structures. Uh, they are highly flammable products. Um, we think you should have sprinklered buildings and other safety precautions. The responsible tent companies will follow the rules and the applicable laws, um, but there are others we've seen in other states who do not. Uh, we agree the time has come to permit the sale of full line of consumer fireworks, but we encourage you to take seriously the potential unintended consequences of the legislation as currently proposed. Thank you. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Cook. Uh, is there anyone else? I see that um, Mr. Chris Parsons. Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Ingerberg. If I could, maybe uh, Senator Rarick, maybe you can tell me how many tents are uh, utilized during the during the uh, during the season I guess I don't know I've been, I know I have one or two in my district Eric and uh, then then we have to get to our testifier uh, uh, mr. chair I don't know the total um, if I rely back to uh, TNT I believe they said hundred and mr. chair members mr. I would Omer. say uh, approximately in Minnesota there's include TNT and other Companies, there's probably close to 150. At the current time? At the current time. All right. And those are low-level fireworks? Correct. All right. Mr. Parsons. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Chris Parsons. I'm president of the Minnesota Professional Firefighters, and I will be uh, very brief. Uh, I just want to echo the uh, words of my colleague, uh, Fire Chief uh, Kiewicz. And uh, in my 20 years in the fire service, um, I've seen uh, increase in uh, structure fires and injuries caused by fireworks, especially around uh, Independence Day celebrations. Uh, our mission is to protect the lives and property of the uh, people of Minnesota, and anything that would increase the, uh, the, the likelihood of uh, property loss, lives lost, and injuries is something that uh, we would have to oppose. So I'm in, uh, my uh, group is in opposition to this bill. All right. Thank you, Mr. Parsons. Uh, is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to speak on this bill? Hearing none, we'll open it up for committee, uh, com committee discussion. Uh, just like the last bill, I've been told that some of the jurisdiction will be in the local government committee, so if this would pass this committee, that is where this bill will go. So I'm trying to keep our discussion on to the jurisdiction areas of our committee. Um, do we have any questions or comments? Senator Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I wonder if somebody could tell me how far a bottle rocket goes. Because I would think that's part of this, isn't it, Ariel? Mr. Ulmer. Mr. Chair, um, my best guess would be 60 feet. 60 feet. And Mr. Chair, uh, to the same Hall. person, um, can you with a bottle rocket hit a target 40 feet away, you think? Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, Mr. members, Ulmer? that would be very difficult. Okay. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Uh, I was a young kid, and I did everything I could get my hands on, and uh, including bottle rockets. Until I started seeing where they were going and um, how many were shot, not at me, although I think some of my friends probably shot them at me, uh, they never hit. But the ones that were not shot at me would take off and had no control of where they went. Now, none of my friends got their eyes popped out. But my question is, 
can you guarantee that no I will be taken out? I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the uh, the senator that I won't be taken out from one of my granddaughters if their neighbor decides to use a bottle rocket. Sir Rarick, uh, Mr. Chair, members, you know, um, this is a, a question that is asked quite often, and you know, no, we cannot guarantee uh, safety of everyone who is using them. Uh, but the thing is that. Uh, we cannot guarantee kids will be safe when they participate in youth sports, when they decide to get on their bicycle, or when they get in their car to ride with us anywhere we're going. Um, and there are some risks, I realize, and I'm not going to diminish that fireworks are intrinsically dangerous. Uh, but like most things, um, if you follow instructions, uh, that minimizes the risk. And I believe many of these uh, retailers have safety videos available for people to follow uh, so they can learn how to use them correctly and public service announcements will be available. So um, I, I acknowledge we cannot eliminate the risk of injury, uh, but I, I do believe that these are, have become much, much safer than they were back in the 70s. Okay. Chief Kiewicz, you wanted to weigh in. Uh, Mr. Chair, to uh, the Senator's question, um, I don't know the exact distance a bottle rocket goes. I do know that it goes far enough to start a neighbor's house on fire. Um, been on a couple of those. I do know they go far enough to get into somebody's garage that starts their house on fire. And what, when we're talking about structure fires, uh, what people don't realize is the, the devastation to an individual's life and when they lose that property. Uh, most structure fires, they'll be out of the house for at least six months. And that's a cost that we all bear through our insurance premiums. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Senator Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and looking at this list of opponents, I don't know if you've seen this, uh, Senator, uh, fire marshals, insurance federation, just to name a few here. Senator Hall. Um, I want to bring everyone's attention to what would be in our committee member packets. It's a list of organizations that have stated opposition. And if uh, I may go continue. Go ahead, Senator Hall. Um, the Academy of Those That uh, Treat Eyes, because I can't pronounce that long word. Uh, the Professional Firefighters, I, I, and I won't go on and on. So I have an amendment uh, to this I'd like to uh, present, an uh, oral amendment, and I'd like our uh, Council staff to respond to it. A research? Uh, council? Mr. Backus. Are you familiar with Senator Hall's amendment? Uh, Mr. Chair and members, yes, I, I can read it. Um, the amendment, the oral amendment, would be on page seven of the A3. Uh, after page seven, after line seven, insert, it would be new paragraph G. And it would read, nothing in sections 624.20 to 624.25 authorize the sale or use of aerial and audible devices within a metropolitan county as defined in sections uh, 473.121, subdivision 4. So, Mr. Chair? Senator Hall. This has become, uh, at least from my point of view, a metro and rural um, question uh, where there are a lot of people um, there's uh, more of a discussion and I know a lot of the local officials have said boy I hope we don't ever have to deal with this uh, I just think it's prudent if the outstate uh, senators representatives want to represent their areas with having this so be it but uh, the Metro 7 County I'm excluding from this bill uh, through this amendment uh, in aerial or very loud um, products. Okay. Senator Rarick, uh, what do you think of Senator Hall's amendment? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, could I hear it again? I guess at, on the, from what I'm hearing, I, I, I have understood all along. That's why we put the idea of the ordinance in. Um, so if I could hear that again, just to... Um, I'm Council, could you repeat the amendment? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, page seven, after line seven, insert uh, new paragraph G. Nothing in sections 624.20 to 624.25 authorize the sale or use of aerial and audible devices within a metropolitan county 
as defined in section four in section 473.121 subdivision 4 so essentially what this would do is it would simply prohibit all sales and all uses of aerial and audible devices in the seven county metropolitan area sir uh, thank you mr. chair um, if if that is uh, I have known all along that that is the area that uh, is of most concern for because of the high population um, if that is the committee's uh, desire um, I would be willing to accept that amendment uh, Senator Rarick, um, your bill originally allowed local control, the local political subdivision, to make the decision of whether or not this classification of fireworks would could be uh, allowed in their particular jurisdiction. Um, this one, this amendment, would mean that the state government is going to make that decision for the metropolitan area, and uh, ignore, or perhaps not ignore is the wrong word, but would not care to know what the wishes are of a political subdivision, and that we, under our own wisdom, will preclude metropolitan communities from having this classification of fireworks. Is that correct? Uh, I'm just wondering if you really understood the amendment. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, um, I guess, yeah, I, I do believe that the, the provision would stand that in all the other remaining um, 80 counties that that would still be there. Um, I, I'm not going to say that I necessarily uh, uh, favor the amendment, but I'm not, I, I would say I'm not completely opposed as well if that um, gives comfort to members believing that the vast majority is of those areas do not wish to have them and like I said I, I do know that there are a, a lot of cities um, in the metropolitan area that have um, talked to me and that they would be in, enacting the ordinance to say no um, and I guess I, I guess maybe I would be uh, ask Senator Hall I would maybe think that this falls under the jurisdiction of his committee a little bit more than this one and maybe he and I could work on it and have that in his committee um, at the next stop if he's uh, willing to, to do that so we could. Mr. Mr. Chair. All right. Senator Hall. No. Oh, Senator Ingerbritson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I would ask the question as well. Um, uh, when you talk about Section 1 where you divide up the sales tax to the local fire safety account, uh, are we going to ban the uh, seven county metro from drawing from that safety account off the proceeds as well? Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, Sir uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen, uh, that would not uh, be my intention, no. I, I know that we have fire departments from around the state um, that uh, would still be responding to calls, whether it was legal there or not. That would, the use is happening there right now, whether it's legal or not. So I, that would not be my intention if we were to do this to, to limit that. Uh, Senator well, Hall. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Senator Paul, Richard. well, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here, uh, and I don't totally disagree with Senator Hall's amendment, but if you're not going to allow it to happen in the seven-county metro, the fires won't go on. Um, so... Should they really have the the opportunity to spend the money uh, um, that's going to be actually uh, made or, or uh, uh, out in the metro area? I mean, the metro area is going to be selling the the uh, and the part of the proceeds uh, from the metro area that is going to go into the cities and in, into the seven county metro. Or am I confused? And I rarely get confused. Sir Rarick, did you want to answer this? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I guess with many of the things that we deal with here at the legislature, um, we collect taxes in one area and, and send them to another area of the state. Uh, so, like I said, I, I still believe even if we this were to pass and this provision were in, 
um, and, or any other jurisdiction that would uh, decide not to sell them there. Uh, right now, they're not legal in the state, and they're being used. So uh, yeah. I think that would continue, and so that's why I wouldn't uh, look to restrict that. Any further discussion on the Hall Amendment? One question that I had, Senator Hall, is if the Metropolitan County area that you're describing in your amendment would not be allowed to sell fireworks, although any other sale would uh, outside of the Metropolitan area, then my question would be is where does the money that's directed into the fire accounts would, could they be applied statewide, even though the metropolitan community is not you, not collecting that uh, income, or would it be only could be allowed in non-metropolitan communities where those taxpayers are p making that payment? Mr. Hall, Mr. Chair, thank you for the question, and it uh, is very similar to uh, what Senator Ingerbretson's question, of course, was. Uh, I personally uh, see that if you're going to increase the sale of uh, fireworks just on the borders, you're going to have more coming in. So I'm okay with um, the metro area receiving some of that, and maybe it should be a percentage. Um, but I think something is going to go over the line there. But that's up to the committee, up to the author, what he wants to do. Well, I would imagine uh, if the bill would pass, uh, well, the amendment, talking to the amendment now, the amendment is getting close to uh, local government committee jurisdiction and not necessarily ours, number one. Number two, uh, if we're going to talk about where the cash flow goes from that tax account, then it would have to have a, a stop in the tax committee as well. Uh, Mr. So, Chair? Uh, Senator Hall. I, I would have your same concerns. Uh, if a uh, local jurisdiction opts out, do they still get, their fire people still get to use some of that money? And I would assume they would. Senator Dietzik. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'd also say that this is a tax discussion that we're having in the Judiciary Committee. Um, but as to get to your question and part of Senator Ingebrigtsen's question, you can say that it is the sales are not prohibited in the seven county metro area, but that doesn't prohibit people who live in the seven county metro area to, on their way up to Cook County for the 4th of July, to buy some of those products and so, and then be used up in Cook County. And so they are buying the products. And so I think they should also get a share of those proceeds. So I do think that if, if this were to pass and that, 25% that goes to the state fire service, um, that should go all across the state. The 25% the that goes to that volunteer community fund, the first fund, um, that is mostly for communities under 10,000. So there's already a portion that's carved out that aren't going to several of the cities around this table. So I think that it is only fair that the other half does go statewide because you're gonna have my constituents some of all of your constituents are who are in that seven county metro area might buy them on the way out to some other community across the state. So that's just my opinion. Thank you. Sir Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I, I do believe also the two accounts that we're uh, putting the money into, um, I don't believe we would have the ability to, to restrict that usage as to where they were to go anyway. That would be a we would have to create a completely separate fund to put the money into if we were going to try to do that. And, and I agree with Senator Dietzik. Um, we are going to have people from the seven county metro area buying them. Um, this is not, uh, I, I don't believe this is something that's going to be, uh, should be separated. Chief Kiewicz. Mr. Chair, uh, to uh, the Senator's amendment, uh, on, a, on the basic principle of the bill, we oppose this, no matter where the money goes. It doesn't matter how you split it up, where it goes, how it gets spent. We oppose this um, on principle. Uh, and to the senator's point on banning them or prohibiting them in the seven county metro area, I'd like to point out that uh, many wildfires start from a single spark, whether it be off a train, whether it be a cigarette. Uh, if you look at some of the wildland fires we've had in this state, they started you know, very simply with just one little ember. Bottle rocket is that. 
So the, the hazard in the metro area is, is primarily structures and people, and the hazard in the greater Minnesota is still structures in the communities and on the farms, but also the potential for wildland fire. Well, we have the amendment before us, Senator Ralph, and I do want to remind the committee we're, in, we're getting really close to the use of this room in a few minutes, and if we continue the discussion, we'll have to come back at 6.30. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. A very short question. I want to make sure I understand Senator Hall's amendment. Is it his amend intention that he is going to ban all sales of fireworks in the Seven County area or only the aerial and uh, audible devices? And I don't know whether uh, that was made clear in the amendment. Senator Hall? Um, oh, Council. Mr. Chair, members, the, the oral amendment applies specifically to aerial and audible devices. It doesn't address all those other devices. All right. Further discussion on the Hall amendment. Hearing no, Senator Anderson. Oh, I just got a question about how does this, because it's seven county metro area, you not only have your local city uh, and counties, but then you also have the Met Council question on top of that uh, to deal with this amendment. So I, got, I, got a, I don't know if that has any impl implications there, but it does have some something uh, to Perhaps talk. they can, if this bill passes, they could discuss that in local government committee. Uh, Senator Anderson, uh, just a quick aside, um, I know that Hennepin County taxpayers uh, have an additional sales tax placed on sales tax pur purchases when it comes to uh, financing a sports stadium, although there are residents that come into Hennepin County and buy things and they ultimately pay the tax for that particular stadium, none of that money goes out into uh, any other area of the state because it's designated for it. Uh, so there is designation for sales tax proceeds. Uh, having no further discussion on the Hall Amendment, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. I want to see hands. Uh, all those in favor? of the Hall Amendment, raise your hand. Three, four, five, six. The Hall Amendment uh, passes, it's adopted. We now have the bill before us. Is there further discussion? Mr. Senator Chairman. Senator Pappas. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, I have to say I was really persuaded by Ms. Cook's comments about the safety issues involved with temporary structures. So I don't want to repeat them. I just think it'd be better to have um, some more permanency and some more professionalism. And also the, uh, one of the gentlemen witnesses mentioned that, that a safety video um, can be shown when people buy fireworks. And I'd, I think that might be more difficult in a temporary structure. So I would just like to move on page six to delete line 6.3 to 6.5, which I think is the language that allows for the temporary structure, and council can correct me if I'm wrong. Council, could you uh, define the amendment? Um, Mr. Chair, I think if, if the amendment is to delete lines 6.3 to 6.5, I mean, I guess that that's the... That's the cap on the number of days you could use a, a temporary structure. So I, I uh, think if you delete that, I assume uh, then you don't have any cap. Right. That's not what I want to do. So, Mr. Chairman, um, Sir Pappas. Mr. Backus, where does it uh, allow temporary structures? Or that it's silent on that. We'd have to create that language. Council, uh, Mr. Chair, if you could give me a few minutes, I could try to draft something for you. Is there any further discussion uh, while council is writing an amendment? Uh, Mr. Chairman? Uh, uh, Senator Latz. Well, we have a pause. I guess there's a question. I have uh, whether or not um, the licensees that would be applying to local governments for authority to do this, uh, do they have provisions for going through background checks? Um, and uh, if not, would Senator Chamberlain need to add a clause to his bill if it moves forward? Uh, through the other committees to cover these background checks as well? 
I'm asking it only partly tongue in cheek. Um, it just happens we got the bills back to back, but it's I think it's a question that probably needs to be explored at some point. Yeah. Mr. Chair. Senator Rarick. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I just uh, received counsel that some uh, cities currently uh, do. It is not uh, necessarily uh, statewide, uh, but some do re require that background check. So we can we can look into that. Senator Rarick, do you know if that reference for a background check for a fireworks uh, operation uh, is in statute? Is it authorized in statute? Uh, Mr. Chair, I will have to look look All that right. up. Right. Mr. Elmer, do you know the answer to that? That I don't know the answer to, Mr. Chair. All I right. do know that there are many cities that do require background checks for the people running the fireworks tents. All right. I think we have to. Council? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair and members, I'll, I'll attempt to read the amendment. It, it might be something that if it, if it goes on might need to be tinkered with in the next committee. Um, so on line 6.3, um, delete may and insert shall. And then line 6.4, delete everything after the first at uh, and After then the on line 6.5 delete everything before a permanent structure so that line that sentence would now read a retail seller of sparkling devices novelties or aerial and audible devices shall operate out of a permanent structure and then I believe it might makes sense after public permanent structure, if you look on line 6.25 and 6.26, uh, insert a, basically say a permanent structure that complies with National Fire Protection Association Standard 11.24-2006 edition, and then strike uh, the rest of 6.23 to 6.26, and then renumber those other clauses. I, I think that would get the concept across. Senator Pappas, does that fit your expectations? Yes, Mr. Chairman, that's my amendment. All right. Don't ask me to repeat it. <laughs> Is there any further discussion on the oral amendment as described by counsel? Senator Pappas moves the oral amendment as described by counsel. Chief uh, Kiewicz. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Pappas, to your amendment, um, I'm going to be frank. Uh, you're going to allow explosive storage in strip malls, in buildings that the fire protection systems are not designed to adequately contain. They will be able to sell these explosives in buildings that are right next to daycares, across the street from schools, wherever. That's what, that's what this does. Uh, NFPA 11224, as I, to reiterate, eliminated the section covering in the most current standard fire protection for brick and mortar structures because this, as I said earlier, the, you can't build, there's no fire protection systems designed that are gonna work in a commercial occupancy in a commercial area. There's standards that allow for the manufacture of fireworks and they, they require setbacks from all other buildings and uh, things of that nature. So I just wanted to make sure that you were aware of that. And Chief, uh, this, this this bill will go on to local government. Uh, that might be a jurisdictional issue regarding local government. Mr. Pappas, Mr. Chairman, I, I just think this bill needs more work, and yes. um, I'll withdraw my amendment. I think it needs more thought um, based on the chief's comments, and I'm not, you know, I just think we should vote against it. All right. Uh, Senator Pappas removes her amendment from consideration. We have the bill before us. Hearing no further discussion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, could we have a roll call, please? Yeah. Uh, do I have a motion? Ha and have that recorded in the journal. Oh, three hands. All right. Uh, it will be recorded in the Senate, seeing three hands in the Senate journal. Uh, do I have a motion? Uh, Senator Ingerbritson moves. Senate file 1621 as amended be recommended pass and move to the local government committee. All those in favor? Oh. Secretary will take the 
roll. Senator Limmer? Yes. Senator Anderson? Yes. Senator Dietzik? No. Senator Hall? No. Senator Ingebrigtsen? Yes. Senator Johnson? Yes. Senator Latz? No. Senator Pappas? Yes. No. Senator Ralph? Having been five yes votes and four no votes, the motion does prevail. There's no further business before this committee. We stand adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chair.